Hey everybody, Norm from Tested here. Jeremy from Tested. And welcome back to Projections, where this week we're gonna go back in time and revisit one of the demos and experiences that you played at this year's Game Developers Conference. This one in augmented reality. What'd you play? As a matter of fact, Norm, two experiences Ooh. on the Magic Leap. The first of which is Grorg Battle. Did I say that right? Gord? Grorg yeah. Battle. Yes, you just gotta say it quickly. You emailed me while I was headed to GDC and you're like, Look what was just announced! It's a multiplayer Magic Leap experience! And I was like, okay, I'll do what I can. Emailed them, got it set up, got to see it. I am so grateful that you did that. Because I thought, after my whole experience, and you know how much I love virtual reality, mm -hmm. and you know how much I think augmented reality is a futuristic technology. Yep. Nonetheless, this was my game of the show. Wow. I loved it. Wow. This was awesome. Okay, so let's, let's set it up. Yeah, so it's set in the world of Dr. Gorbort, which was the free shooting game developed by What A Game Shop in partnership with Magic Leap yeah. to really work out the kinks of UI, world tracking, and be a fun game, uh, free to play for anyone who has a uh, Magic Leap 1. Mm -hmm. So it spun off of, of the Invaders game, which was yes. really awesome. Uh, first person um, single player game. Sure, wave based shooter, robots come at you, use your space. We did an episode on that a few weeks ago and it's fantastic. It's one of the better Magic Leap experiences that we've done. I would say the best. And now they've taken that same universe but they've done something I didn't think that the Magic Leap could do and that is apply augmented objects to other players in your same play space. So, right. the neat, neat thing about Magic Leap, of course, is that it's augmented reality. You have a hand controller, and that can become something in the space, and it does a slam where it looks around and it can discern the geometry in your environment. It can see a table, walls, floors, ceilings, and if you fire a weapon, for instance, it can ricochet or land on those objects. But you only ever see one tra tracked object, or the things that you augment and throw into the space. You don't see other tracked objects with Magic Leap, and it only comes with the one controller. Mm -hmm. But when you incorporate three other players, each of whom are also wearing a Magic Leap setup, it does. That's interesting. So you're saying the blaster that I'm holding and the blaster the other person's holding, we both see the blasters, and it's not just static fauna growing on this table, it's dynamically moving in a shared world. And not just the blasters, but the heads, because the, the headsets are also tracked, of course. And the head of the person over there becomes an a avatar that they choose from a menu, and it's from the same universe. So when you enter the game, you choose what you want to look like. You can be a robot or a woman or a man, and there are all these cartoonish heads, and, and they're funny and they're you know, enigmatic, and they're just a joy to see someone else approach you as this other persona. And I got a question for you. The, the totem, the controller that the Magic Leap uses, yeah. that is tracked by the headset using mag magnetic fields. Yeah. And so that's how the headset knows where it is well to, to it, so it can superimpose and project some kind of hologram on mm -hmm. top of it that makes controller look like a blaster. Now, how does my headset detect the other controller and the other headset when it's across the room? I was equally curious about this because my experience so far tells me that you need to have some visual indicator for your headset to discern, to see something else in 3D. IR lights, and QR codes, something. My understanding something. is their solution is, is more of a, each headset is just sharing world data with each other in a networked fashion. So that while the, each headset knows where it is, is in 3D space, they're able to communicate with other headsets and share where each other is in the same 3D space. As long as the 3D space is mapped in the same way. Everyone exactly. knows the floors where the floor is, that wall is there, so this table is here. So who knows what kind of setup process is required for this kind of thing. It might be very controlled. We were in a, in a living room, a mock living room setup that I'm sure was purpose built very specifically for this experience. Mm. I don't know how easy it is to replicate this in your own home environment. But the promise is immense. I mean, it was so fun to play with other people in the living room environment. As you shoot the other characters, their cartoon heads, their eyes get wide. And I didn't even mention to you that the eye tracking is in there. So they've put to use their eye tracking technology, which so far has only been really to focus, uh, to activate the two focal planes that the Magic Leap apparently uses. Now, that's reflected in your avatar. So where you look, your avatar looks. And when you blink one eye, the avatar blinks one eye. So they come to life in a way that we can't even get in virtual reality yet. That sounds really awesome. I have so many questions. And you got a bunch of those questions answered when you chat with What A Game Studios' Greg Broadmoor. Let's go check it out. 
Hey, Jeremy from Tested here at GDC 2019, talking to Greg Broadmoor from Magic Leap. Greg, I just got to try your new multiplayer experience. It's an extension of Dr. Grodbrot's, yeah, uh, right. the single player game, yeah. and now you've brought that into multiplayer. Uh, why don't you give me just an elevator pitch of what I just played? Yeah, so it was one of the first problems we wanted to solve after we ship Invaders, was how do we share this experience, both for ourselves when we're testing, but also just the share the experience of mixed reality and spatial computing. So what we're showing here is a sort of character-based action game. We've all, you've all got ray guns. You all transform into different characters. That's kind of an exciting thing that we've discovered that we've been thinking about for a while. So when you put the device on and you see someone else wearing the device, you become one of the characters from the Dr. Grobot's world. Where you look, the character looks. When you talk, the character talks. And so it's kind of this just transformative, almost cosplay-like experience, I suppose, and you inhabit another character. So I was shocked. I, I've used the Magic Leap many times. And every time, I know that you've got that track controller, and I expect that to be represented in, in augmented reality. I never knew that you could see other headsets and yeah. track their orientation. How are you doing that? Uh, well, we know where the headset is in relation to the head, and we have to know where the head is to figure out your head pose in the world. So we basically know where both these things are so we can fix to them. Um, and so, yeah, it's really as simple as it is. And then there's a bunch of other input, interesting inputs coming in, like voice and eye tracking and other things that we haven't activated yet that we're actually able to infer a lot of sort of performance, if you like, from the characters, from the players. So is that any kind of optical from headset to headset tracking? Does the headset see IR beacons on the other headset? No? No, I probably... I, I, I am not the technical person. Anyway, I probably couldn't even tell you how it worked if I wanted to, <laughs> but it's not that. Wow, I mean, that's impressive then, because it was locked down. I mean, yeah. it, was, it wasn't it was floating around the head. It was consistently locked down, and as soon as the first person got in, that surprised me, but then we added two more players, and we had four players in there. Suddenly, there's a lot more track geometry than I've ever had in Magic Leap before. Yeah, it's, it's fun, isn't it? Because, like I said, when people have a mixed reality experience, it's surreal and amazing for them, but for an outsider, it's like, what's happening in there, right? Yeah. They're, they're in their own world, even though they're still in the real world. Uh, this allows us to actually finally share things, and it, we, we really want to encourage play between players standing there. So we have this moment where you can pour tea for the others and, and get that mixed reality aspect. Because most people, what they do is they pour a little bit of tea for each other and then they pour tea in the world and make a mess. So it's just kind of a good, fun way to break the ice with this kind of system. I'm really glad to see you putting that eye tracking to use beyond the two focal distances. And now you can actually see people looking in different directions. It's really the first multiplayer experience that I've had that uses eye tracking. And yeah. I, I think that's going to be huge for VR going forward once that becomes Absolutely. a technology that's embraced. Um, was that... Uh, uh, pretty trivial for you guys to incorporate that? I think for our lead programmer, Tom, uh, it was trivial because he's a bit of a brainiac. But um, yeah, I think it's quite tricky. Obviously, there's a lot going on behind the scenes there. What's exciting for me is that this is only the tip of the iceberg because there's a lot of interesting biometrics and inferences you can get from the eye tracking, from voice, from head position, from other things. Uh, so we'll be able to bring more performance data, I think, into the final experience when we, when we figure out what the full scope of it is. It's fun. Everyone's got a laser blaster and they're firing different directions and it's all tracked and reflected off of the walls that yeah. we have in our space. It's a ton of fun, new level kind of experience. I love the fact that when you're out of the game, you you still exist in the world, but your head turns into a skull. Yeah. It's a wonderful indication of, of, the, of your game is over, but you're still in the space. Yeah, right? and we keep on puppeteering that as well, so we still have all the performance with that character, which is quite good fun. Right. Yeah. Great experience. Thank you so much, Greg. Awesome. Thank you. So part of the problem when we talk about Magic Leap is, and we have to acknowledge this, so few people have them. This is not a device that many of our viewers have at home. It is almost certainly not a device that many of our users have three friends who have them at home. Yeah. So this is a glimpse of the future. Where this is not current technology in the sense that everyone should go out and buy it and we're endorsing this from that stance. This is just very exciting to see augmented reality evolve to a multiplayer experience. And well, see, just imagine where that might be headed. And also, this is one of the first few augmented experiences where the thing being augmented is not a static object. You know, in all the past Magic Leap experiences we've had, the only dynamic object is the controller, and that's not tracked using the same type of optical and world sensing sensors. By dynamic, you mean like human controlled. Or human controlled, yeah. or even movable objects. Well, you right? can fire things into the world, you could put cubes into the space, but they're always completely uh, you know, AI driven. But they're not tied to driven. real physical objects. Exactly. Right, I couldn't have a cube that gets augmented and then throw the cube. Right. Now we're talking about not only are there other objects that are tracked, they're people that are yeah. tracked. And that type of social, you know, opportunity to augment the social experience, that is, I think, where Magic Leap sees a lot of potential in conversations. What is the future of AR, you know, chat rooms? Well, this version of it, this is like the beginning of it. It's funny you mentioned social because the other experience that I went to, 
is vastly different, but mm. it's a, it, they're thinking very high-minded about it. They have very high aspirations for this. It's, they're calling it Project MICA. Okay, now this is an experience that they've brought to Sundance and they've shown before, but this was a, a new version of it. Okay, this is an artificial intelligent being that they are developing at Magic Leap. And I was able to go into a room by myself, door closed, and have a, 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 I had a, a seat at a table and wearing the Magic Leap, I saw her walk out of behind a wall and sit down with me and make eye contact. And they have put an immense amount of effort into creating an artificial being. That a can, CG character. It's basically a CG character that can interact with humans in a way that they want to feel more lifelike than anything in that you know the other guys are developing your series, your Amazon Echoes, all this other stuff. Now, and when you say interact with you or other people, interaction primarily we think of as voice interaction. So I presume there is some type of conversation you can have. You would presume, but there wasn't. But there wasn't. So what is the interaction? It was for this interaction, and this experience was different than the other ones. Mine was that I got to sit down, and initially sh there's just feeling each other out, like feeling comfortable with one another. So she mm. sits down, she makes eye contact with you, and then she closes her eyes. So long that I felt like I was supposed to. And so I kind of took that cue and I closed my eyes, I opened them up, and when I was looking back at her, she kind of looked over my shoulder and I looked to see what is she referring to. And then she kind of smiled. I don't know what that was all about. Mm -hmm. But then she motioned to this wall beside me. And then she picked up a shape that was sitting on the table and, oh no, actually before we even got there, she walked me over to the other side of the room where I picked up my Magic Leap controller. I didn't have that at first. That act of even leading you somewhere. Exactly, exactly. It's interesting because you're talking about something that doesn't exist, a virtual person. When we play video games where NPCs, their right. sole jobs are to lead you to places, but with dialogue, this is an NPC who's leading you with gestures and emotion. Right, and this is, I, their AI is not just figuring out like what, how to make eye contact with you. Their yeah. AI is actually driving her ability to navigate a room as well. So mm. she's walking over to that space and I follow and I take my controller. Anyway, we sit back down and then she takes up a shape off of the table and she makes sure that I understand what she's doing. And then she places it on a blank canvas on the wall that's right next to us. And then she looks at me and she smiles and then she waits for me to do the same thing. And so I pick up one and I put it sort of next to hers and she inspects it and she looks over at me and she smiles. And all of this feels like it could be extremely canned. This feels like this could be an experience that every single person has. Scripted. Exactly. But that's not at least what I'm told. That mm -hmm. is not what's going on. And she'll actually place things in different places based on where you place them. And obviously, the way that you, um, whether or not you take the time to make something happen in the time frame that she needs or expects, that might alter her behavior. And to hear that the Magic Leap team talk about this project, they have grand ambitions. And I, and I, and I asked them afterwards, I said, is your thought that Micah is going to be Magic Leap's Siri? Is it like Magic Leap's AI core? Cortana. Cortana is the perfect example. Uh, and they, they seem to say no, but it felt to me like that would fit in with their vision. Like they want this AI experience to be far beyond it like a personal assistant. They don't yeah. want Micah to be your person who you go to if you need something purchased on Amazon. Yeah. They want you to have an interpersonal relationship with an AI counterpart. In, in VR research, we've spoken to a lot of developers who work in the field of virtual humans and avatars, and a lot of that is what it takes means to track a real person and bring the essence of a real person into a virtual space so that all the interactions that a real person that you and I would have in a real space mm -hmm. can actually translate, because it is a lot more than just the audio. It's the visual, it's subtle cues, right. it's blinking, it's head nods. And it sounds like they're doing that, but without the puppeteering, without the person wearing tracking markers, all kind of algorithmically mm -hmm. and all in, in a theory working so that 
even without the verbal communication, it felt like you guys were communicating. You were being led. You understood an in intent right. from this character. And that's really cool. That's really interesting. It's certainly ambitious. I mean, we think of AI already existing in games with this like pathfinding, and we think of AI in terms of like Google, where they're trying to figure out what you're searching for. And in some respects, like this is a combination of the different types of AI technologies that we're very familiar with in our daily lives. Um, but in a new sense, in the same way that augmented reality is, you know, far-reaching technology that's applying VR to the real world. Uh, th it's a very interesting project, and I, I'll be curious to see how Project MICA evolves. Because I, as I say, to hear these developers talk about this project, their eyes start to glisten. Like, it's real, they're really thinking big on this. It's really interesting. You also think of like something like the Turing test, which is a test for AI, one of the tests for AI, just based on conversation. Yeah. This is everything but that. It so is, far. Right. Can you believe that a virtual person is believable almost without being able to identify the discrete cues? Like when you say things like she smiled, so that mm -hmm. indicated that she acknowledged me. Like that is a discrete cue. They programmed in Micah smiles when mm -hmm. she detects, it detects that person has done certain tasks. And I can imagine further down the line where those cues start blending in with the animation with their programming so they become less explicit and more subconscious. It's funny you mentioned the Turing test because I think there's definitely a test going on with Michael already mm. that questions how accepting are people of artificial intelligence beings, of augmented reality, right. completely digital beings, yeah. who n you're not just speaking to as you would with an Amazon Echo or with your phone, but you actually can see and make eye contact with. If you allow yourself to suspend your disbelief, you smile back, and I did. Like I wanted to engage in this act of, you know, relating to this artificial intelligence. At the same time, I watched other people do it, and they were very scientific about it, very straight-faced. One person got up and and walked around the table and sat inside of her. That's weird. And the developers were actually taken aback by that. Like that, this was not something that they were comfortable with. And they, I think, they failed that test of like the believability of these cues, and they treated it just like. Yeah, the series of ones and zeros that it actually is. Exactly. Wow, that is that is super interesting. I'm also curious because this is a photo real representation of an avatar. If these same interaction models would apply to something completely cartoonish, something that did not have to look like a real human, mm -hmm. like can those things work as well? I mean, hey, people have relationships with dogs. I mean, it's not about the fact that it's human. It's about eye contact and yeah. is there a soul there? Yeah. Just pump that oxytocin into the room, <laughs> and I'm sure all will all work out. That's very cool. We hopefully will see more of this stuff at future events, but uh, we'll have more coverage of GDC and things you saw uh, in future episodes. Uh, and thanks for watching. Bye. But wait, there's more to this episode. Since we recorded what you just saw, a mm -hmm. uh, new game has come out that we wanted to make sure we cover, and that is Vacation Simulator. By Alchemy Labs, now part of Google. Yeah. Of course, Job Sim is one of the first VR games, really. I mean, it came out around the same time as the Vive did, three years ago this month. Mm -hmm. and, and it was one of the first things I actually played that had tracked controllers on uh, what was then the prototype for the HTC Vive. I mean, it was a finished game. I mean, yeah. it was one of the first real experiences you could have, and, and they, they, they did a great thing. They, yes. they realized how interfaces could work in virtual reality well, mm -hmm. right? Like the Duplo sized objects as opposed to small Lego sizes. You go with the big ones and you got the big buttons and big things you pick up and you could make food and you could be in a garage and you would be changing out oil. And it, there was a lot of comedy because there was a lot of things you could do. You could drink the motor oil, yes. right? You could put anything on the fryer. The and game was clever, not only in just the dialogue and the world they built of these robots simulating the human experience, but also in the systems that they designed so that you could discover yeah. a lot of interactions between the objects. Now, since then, Alchemy Labs went on to develop the Rick and Morty game, which mm -hmm. is more narrative-driven, a lot of same ideas in terms of interacting things, and this goes back to that world of Job Simulator with Vacation Simulator. Now, the structure of this game is a little different. Well, you are a human, as you were in Job Simulator, and you are experiencing vacation as the bots appear to think that it worked, yep. which is not exactly how you and I think that a vacation works. Uh, you show up in the world, and, and once you get past uh, the introductory phase where you're talking to these two bots and they're introducing you to the space, uh, you can venture into any of three worlds all at once. They're all open to you. There's a beach, there's a forest, and there's a mountain. A snowy mountain. 
And in each of these worlds, unlike in Job Simulator, where those environments were all very discrete, single location things, whether it was in a garage or right. a convenience store, here you actually get to explore a little of that space through teleporting by nodes. That's right. Now, they did that in Rick and Morty, so we're familiar with uh, that system of locomotion, it's, but there is no smooth locomotion yeah. option. This is teleporting to these nodes, and it makes sense in their design philosophy because they do an interesting thing with each of those nodes. Each of them are areas that you're supposed to walk around in, so there's an element of room scale. But if you don't have the space to move around, they've actually designed smaller nodes for those spaces so that you can just stand and turn around. But basically, the more space you have in your room scale environment, the more space you'll be able to walk around in those areas. Yes, and because these nodes are now uh, in these themes of the beach, the forest, and the mountain, uh, they can be a little more creative. And what these nodes essentially are are the mini games. You're supposed to recover these memories and ideas you're unlocking new locations, unlocking, uh, this, learning the mini games, getting harder and harder, beating these challenges. And they, there's wide ranging of things you can do. Yeah, absolutely. Although there are a lot of uh, duplicates from world to world. So yeah. there's always going to be a, somebody who has a photo booth and they, this person wants you to go out into the world and photograph specific objects or combinations of objects, bring the photograph back, put it in the thing. If you return enough of them, you get a memory. And as you said, these are this is the grind of this game, which is you are going out into this world and you're creating memories and they hand them to you. If you co uh, collect five in any one world, you can enter the second phase of that world. Each of these have a, a gated second area that mm -hmm. you can only get to once you accomplish enough things and create five memories. Yep, and the games range from you know uh, fishing to some slingshotting, to throwing snowballs, and each of them is a, they're very cleverly designed and there's a lot of dialogue in them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're very, very pleasant. Well, yeah, they're very pleasant. I think that they're tailored to, as Jobsim was, people who are new to virtual reality. Totally. I My family, love this game. My kids who rarely play virtual reality at all, my wife who probably plays even less than them, they, they loved sitting in the bathtub for about 20 minutes. Like when in you spawn yes, when yeah. you in this game, you enter this bathroom and you create your hairstyle and you do put your color on. But there's also a bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> you can go sit in it, you turn the water on, put the bubbles in and play with the toys. My, every one of my family sat down on the floor and splashed around for just like 15 minutes, they were having a blast in the bathtub. And that's, I think, part of the magic of what Alchemy Labs realize is when you create systems that work as you would expect in the real world, the waffle iron works like a waffle yeah. iron, and you can put weird things in it, you know, the, the, the snowballs are all pick upable and throwable, right. that satisfaction is very rewarding for people who are new to VR because Nothing breaks VR more than wanting to do something and not being able no, to. No, this do. game's full of being able to do things. Like there's a yeah. telephone, you can lift it up, and it, the sound comes from this speaker or this one, depending on where you hold yep. the headset. And there's two buttons on the phone. It's a binary phone, zero and one. But the voice on the phone guides you through this menu system, and you can order room service and anything you want. You can order half eaten, eaten pancakes with mayonnaise, and they come up the elevator, and it arrives at your door, and you can finish eating them. There, there's a computer with a mouse. You can use the computer and the mouse, and you can do things online. Uh, you can combine all kinds of things in the, in the kitchens. Right? I felt like I was in a theme park, like a, yeah. a very like a, a theme park that, that I could, like a, a perfect children's park where it's not the real world, but there are things that emulate the real world that are fun to do. But in that same sense, it was a kid's theme park. It very much feels like a kid's game, which is ironic because none of the VR headsets are designed for children. Uh, even PSVR, and the game's coming out PSVR this summer, uh, they gated at I think 12 or 13, just mm -hmm. like the PC headsets do. Uh, so it's interesting given that. It, I think it's really tailored towards new people who are into VR. For me, I want more from a locomotion system. I want to move around the world in different ways. Um, I want more you know, interactivity with the world beyond picking things up and delivering items. There's a few successes for me in this game. I love the sports area on the beach where if you bring different balls to this coach, you actually play games like volleyball or you're trying to throw a soccer ball mm -hmm. past the coach. That was fun. Uh, in the snow area, though, like when you get there, you see people skiing off in the distance. And I'm like, OK, no, that's going to be fun. I'm going to get there. Once you get past the five memory gate, mm -hmm. you go up the mountain. You do get to go skiing, but it's a very, 
it's, it's not a simulation of skiing in any way. It's, it's sort of a comedic approach to skiing where you are standing in one place and the ski slope comes towards you on these uh, conveyor belts. And it's cute. And you hit these jumps and the land sort of goes away, but it doesn't give you a sense of motion. It's a very, they played it very, very, very safe. safe, right? Very this safe. is going to be a game that is not rated intense. This is a... E. It's rated for everyone. This is definitely rated for everyone, not just from like an, a, you know, a mature, maturity standpoint, but from an intensity standpoint. Yep, yep. They, they, it's comfortable, super comfortable to use. And I think they are smart enough to know that this is going to be on PSVR. Yep. Where there might be a lot of younger people playing it, and eventually it's going to come out on the Oculus Quest as well. For many people, that might be their very first six degree of freedom. Uh, VR experience. And would you recommend this to someone as their first experience or would you recommend Job Simulator? I still think Job Simulator because then there's less of the expectation. It's more of a sandbox. Job Simulator, right. you jo don't have to complete all these different nodes. Job Simulator gives you instructions, literally. But then again, every node gives you instructions too in yeah. Vacation Sim. Yeah. It's just you have to ask for them. You have to wave at the bot in order to engage them and they'll walk you through it with dialogue. I think you're right. Job Sim is very much more explicit about what you're supposed to do right now in order to complete this puzzle yeah. and then move on. Uh, whereas Vacation Sim is literally a sandbox in the vacation zone, but and very much so up. everywhere gives me more expectation. I want even more from it. I want more than just the, the main area and the gated area. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want a bigger representation of a forest or, or a mountain. I want multiplayer. I want all these things. We are three years after the launch of Job Simulator, yeah. and I kind of wish that they had gone uh, with something a little more ambitious. I think you're right. I don't think this game is for you and me, though. I, I really think that this is for new people to VR, and it's important that we remember that there's going to be a lot of new people coming into VR this year especially. Totally, totally. And it will be out for Quest. Now, they haven't announced whether they're going to be a part of the cross-buy system, where if you buy it on the Oculus platform, it will also pop up in, in your Quest account. Right. Uh, if that's the case, then $30, I think, totally worth it, because I can't wait to try this in Quest when I can play it anywhere. When you literally can walk around. That's exactly it. Right. Yep, yep. So that's Vacation Simulator uh, out now on uh, Steam VR and the Oculus platform. PSVR on June 18th, Quest at the end of uh, this year. I got one more Magic Leap thing yep. also uh, in, that's new. Uh, right now, if you live in Boston, San Francisco, or Chicago at the flagship AT&T stores, Magic Leap has their units there. I know a lot of people haven't had a chance to try it out yet. And that's where you can actually try out Magic Leap with a special Game of Thrones um, interactive experience. And you got to do this? And I got to do it. It's it's a fun, like, a minute long thing. You know, it's in the world of Game of Thrones. A minute long? Yeah. Is there a line to try it? Yeah, you can sign up. There's a line. Okay. Very, very quickly. There are a lot of costumes. If you like the show, it's going to run through, I believe, the end of May, as long as the show is running right now. Uh, but it might be your first chance to try out Magic Leap. Is there a set? Like, do the augmented objects appear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they built out a small set. I don't want to spoil too much about it. Okay. If you haven't used Magic Leap, here's an easy way to try it for free. So it's yeah. a free way to try that out. That's a good thing. All right. Now the episode's ending. We'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye.